Kearns. This meeting is being Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Tom Kearns, Select Board appointee. Paul. Paul Bone, Recreation Commission appointee. Thank you, Peter. Peter Ward, Select Board appointee. John. Oh, John Cratsley, Select Board appointee. Charles. Charles Phillips, appointee of the Concord Housing Authority. Thank you. And Burton? Burton Flint Planning Board. Thank you. Thank you. And Sarah Grimmel, who I can't quite see you, Sarah, but I know you're back there. <laughs> and Sarah, could you also indicate your appointment? Um, Sarah Grimwood, um, Natural Resources Commission. Fantastic. Thank you. And Diane Proctor, Select Board appointee. Um, we begin tonight by welcoming Tom Wilson and, and Linda Escobedo. Thank you very much. And I don't know who's behind the 617. If they could identify themselves, please. Seven. Excuse me, it's Lynn Spencer. And unfortunately, I could not click in on your Zoom link. Oh. So I'm um, a consultant with um, the Wright Tavern. Okay, well, Lynn, um, we'll do our best to make sure that you are part of the discussion, okay? Thank um, you. Appreciate that. I'll, in the meantime, I'll continue looking for the Zoom link, but what was on your agenda won't open for me. Well, that's okay. I'm so sorry. Maybe, Lynn, what I had to do is I had to copy and paste that into a browser, and then it came up. For some reason, it, it didn't link for me as well, but if you copy the link and put it in your browser, it should work. On the agenda is Thank also you, the meeting ID and password, so you can go to the yeah. Zoom website and it manually input the meeting ID and password, and that should work as well. Okay, well, thanks for the information. I'll give it a try. Thank but you. In the meantime, I can hear you. Terrific. Well, Tom, um, you're first on our agenda tonight, which is the, uh, the Wright Tavern preservation restriction. And I gather it has been accepted by the Historic Commission, but would you catch us up on all the, the, fresh, the fresh information, please? Sure. Well, first of all, I appreciate all um, the support we've had to develop this process. They've given us the time to put it together, although it's been, it's been quite an effort that, uh, frankly, Lynn and Nani McCarthy has put together a document. So what you have is the legal document and then all the attachments and in particular, uh, Lynn and her team did a photographic analysis of all the historical elements. Then we took those things, identified the ones that were really historic and listed them in terms of what's gonna be preserved. So we are committed to move it forward and we um, uh, look forward to addressing any kind of questions you all might have and we're ready to go. Thank you, Tom and Lynn. I can see your- Hi. Thanks. Hey. And hello, Peter. Um, so um, let, 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 would you, do you have some slides you want to show us first, Tom? Uh, no, I didn't really bring any because you, you had all the materials. I mean, we I have all the materials. All the documents if you need them, but um, we may want to do it, you know, on a as needed basis. Well, I have a, I have a question, Tom. Um, I, having read through everything as, as carefully as I can without the architectural wisdom of Tom and the legal expertise of Burton, um, and Nancy uh, is not here tonight. Um, she's her, her last evening with her family. Um, that's not that the family's disappearing, but her daughter is going back. Um, so it's her last time to have dinner with her with her daughter uh, before she returns to California, I think. Um, I noticed that the, the date of 1815 recurs continuously, Tom, as, as the date um, in which it, uh, you know, various uh, parts of the tavern are, are are kind of anchored. Uh, how does this fit in with our uh, 1776 and our sensibility that this was a place where uh, where the, the founders of this country originally gathered? And I wonder if you could clarify, I just, is it really an honest, open question? I just wonder oh, how that's that- That's a great question. Super great. Lynn, you might want to pick the, that up. Um, I can just work to some of it, but you know, you've know, you been involved in this a little bit more than I have. My understanding is that, 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 you know, obviously it was built in 1747. It was a place where the Provincial Congress was, where the, you know, the British, where the, 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 the colonial militia, all on Patriots Day and all that. Well, you know, that like, you all know that history. And then um, in the early, in the late, um, in early 1800s, uh, Middlesex Hotel was built across the street. 
and basically bankrupted the the bank, the the, uh, the tavern because everybody now the town select board or whatever they went over to the new fancy place with the big bar and all that stuff, and consequently the tavern itself uh, sort of fell into some disrepair and they that was sold and and went through a couple of different hands and ended up uh, with um, Francis Jarvis uh, who was a well-known baker um, did some transformation to the building itself and. And so a lot of that like, happened around that time frame. Am I correct with that, Lynn? In terms of yes, you are. Yes, you're doing very well, Tom. Very well. Um, <laughs> so the architectural fabric analysis, which was put together by Bill Finch of Finch and Rose, um, derived in, in part from the work that uh, on the 2014 historic structures report uh, prepared by Ground Root. What Bill's document does is give us the photographic background of what some of the narrative says in that historic structures report. But like many buildings in New England, in fact, like the houses you live in today, this building had evolved over time. You know, various owners made changes based on necessity, their requirements, or their tastes. And for instance, on the southerly portion of this building, the, the mantles, um, which you rightly referred to Diane as, as being 1815, circa right. 1815, right. are federal period pieces. In the same way, the room on the um, south, on the northeast side is probably 1780. Wow, okay. So part of what we're doing, and, and, and that we do that by looking at it stylistically as well as, as um, paint analysis and <laughs> Right now, Bill is in the process of doing that level of work. Um, so the point is, yes, the right tavern had evolved. <laughs> we even have the sunroom from the early 20th century. Sure so it's all, it's all part of a story. Um, and I think no building is actually pure in itself unless it goes through a restoration that would scalp <laughs> these later changes and destroy them. So I think the, the Legacy Trust, you know, is working with us to say, well, okay, we've got something that represents this kind of continuum. Um, you know, each of, each of there's, there's chapters to be told here. It doesn't diminish or take away the importance of what happened here in 1774 and 75. It's just part of the story. Thank you, Lynn. That's very helpful for, for me, at least. Um, I, I have one uh, just other just point to make is that there's some reference to some funding for landscaping. And my understanding is that that's not something that the CPC can can support. Uh, Heather, am I correct in that? Um, <clears throat> so, so it kind of depends. I don't I don't think um, landscaping was a line item in, right. in this project though. So it's not something we have to be concerned about at this okay. moment. I thought I, I thought I saw that and, and just wondered. I just wanted to alert you to the fact that landscaping is not generally a, under the under the umbrella or the aegis of the CPC. Do remember the commission, if I'm correct. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, are are there questions that the rest of the um the, that the board has about the the presentation or the plans? Okay, John. Yeah, um, I was curious about Exhibit E, the restriction guidelines. Um, how was that developed? So, uh, Nadia McCarthy, who is uh, who's the attorney who worked with us in developing the document, she has quite a lot of experience developing um, these kinds of documents. She couldn't be on this evening. Um, she might come out a little bit later, but she's got um, child responsibilities, so we say. Um, and so she... Um, it, it, one of the questions often is, and in, in when we're doing, um, you know, we identify something as being uh, historic and we want to preserve it. Sometimes it needs to be repaired. And at what point in time do you need to then go get authority to, to make whatever? So that was set up as a set of guidelines based on her experience in working with other organizations of establishing these. It's also been things that have been reviewed by the Mass Historic Commission. As, as guidelines to inform the historic commission who ultimately I think will be the administrator of this um, agreement 
um, as to what we can and can't do, when we need to go go to say we need to get um, a, approval if we want to make some sort of changes. But if we wanted to make a small repairs or some small, small things, we really don't need approval for that because it's not changing the character at all in terms of the, the item. So it was set up to try to define what that meant in as, as clear as, as attorneys can be. And John, you probably know better than most of <laughs> the, uh, the challenges. Oh. That was the reason that was set up and it was- uh, are, you, are you comfortable with these? Uh, yeah, as, once again, I'm not an attorney and I've never experienced having to gone through commissions and so, things of that nature. Um, I was very comfortable with it. Uh, Lynn, you worked with it some and perhaps you can, can comment on it. Sure, I, I can do that. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay, so it's very similar to, in fact, the um, it's based really on what MHC puts out as its draft preservation and restriction. For those observing, could you remind us what MHC is? Oh, sure, sorry, sorry, the Mass Historical Commission, which by the way, will ultimately be reviewing this restriction before it gets registered. Um, and when they, they have a program called the Massachusetts Preservation Projects Fund, when you get a grant from that program, they provide a preservation restriction that goes in perpetuity. And that major minor category that's described in, in attachment E is really drawn from their model restriction. So it helps make those distinctions about what's major and minor as the reviewers are considering it. John, does that address your question? Yep, yep, yep Mark. I just wanted to know if both everybody who was involved was comfortable with these guidelines or they're, they're, they're quite specific. Yeah. yeah. They're both specific and quite different between the major and the minor, aren't they? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. minor so I just want to be sure that the trust was comfortable that that's not something they they were they participated in. Well, we we were, we have reviewed it on a number of times and you know to the extent to which the experience will tell as we as we build a precedence, I think is going going forward um, as we do things. But you know, the biggest change is really going to be occurring over the next year, eighteen months, and that's when we're going to need to work pretty closely with the CHC and Lynn and her organizations um, uh, on terms of exactly what kind of changes we're we making and modifying to, to build the the right tavern that we're all looking forward to, and at the same time preserving the that fabric. Too. So, Right. Um, my other question was on page seven of the rest of the uh, uh, preservation restriction in number eight, uh, third paragraph down. I'm I'm kind of, I'm really talking from some dispute resolution experience. I noticed that if you can't resolve this particular dispute on casualty damage and destruction, which we hope never happens, you all you've committed yourself to binding arbitration. Um, and I just wondered if you might want, would, would consider um, a, a mediation clause uh, prior to binding arbitration, um, only because it might save you a ton of money uh -huh. um, and, and all the complexity of, of binding arbitration. Thank you, Judge Crassley, for that. <laughs> but I just thank you. It's unsolicited but prudent advice. I, to answer your question, I would always prefer mediation as opposed to arbitration for the reason you, you mentioned, and I think it's kind of in keeping with our old values as well. Um, but we didn't put that in the language, perhaps it was an oversight of, was on my part, but um, is there, uh, how would we do this given where we are right now this evening in terms of that document? Um, if, if we wanted to do that, so it's something we could introduce you know, tomorrow the next day or some time, you know, or, or if you do it tonight. I don't want to get into wordsmithing it was tonight, but what would be the process for making that kind of adjustment if we needed to? John, do you have some advice? I don't know what your uh, levels of approval and, like, and whether your attorneys can put it back in, um, whether it's just uh, a nuisance at this point to make a change. Um, and, and whether you'd have to go back to the Concord Historic Commission another time right. with a change like that. So maybe I've, maybe I've raised something that isn't worth bothering with at this point. I don't, I don't think a change like that would require you to go back to the Historical Commission. Um, 
So if that's something that they want to do, I, I think that would be, that, that would be fine. So Tom, it sounds like this inundation is reasonably routine in that sense. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so um, if, if, with if, with you with your understanding, um, I'll speak with Nadia tomorrow and um, ask her for language that we could insert ahead and leave the arbitration as a, you know, as a alternative, but really put a. Yeah, it would be if the mediation failed, uh, arbitration would be next. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you, John. Any other comments? I think Peter's hand was raised next. I was just waiting for John. I said, any other comments on John? No, no thank you. Okay, Peter. Yeah. And Tom. Thank you. I happen to notice uh, in the restriction document itself, there was, I don't believe any mention about um, the land or property surrounding the structure. And I was wondering how and where that would be handled or addressed in terms of restrictions. My, my understanding is that that really, once you, and I'm not sure how many inches from the building is becomes part of the, of the um, jurisdiction, if you will, of the Historic District Commission. Perhaps Peter can, Nobody can weigh in a bit on that in terms of providing some clarification on that. Because um, anything, any, any of sort of significant change on that would be something we we want to be able to. Um, you know, there may be things that you need to do, or that first parish needs to do on, on its property, of which um, this sits. And so, my sense is that that any kind of jurisdiction would be part of the HDC. But maybe Peter, you can shed some light on that. Well, I'm not sure I can, but I, I do know, I think, Peter, it's a good question. I there I don't suspect, and Lynn, you correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think there's any original, call it fabric, left in the landscape around the building, although we haven't really done an archaeological approach yet, right? So we don't know where the, the cisterns were and the, the, the uh, chicken coops and the various outbuildings. Um, I don't know that we're ready to do that scope of work yet. Um, but I, so I, so in other words, I'm not sure we know what to put a restriction on because we're not sure what's there. And now there are layers of easements and, you know, the property has been absorbed into the first parish campus. And, um, I feel like that's a bigger question than what we're looking at in the building proper. Um, but I, what I suspect and Tom, correct me if I'm wrong is if we are fortunate enough to move out into the landscape and to begin to do some um um some related work we would approach it in a similar fashion we'd uncover original fabric we'd be very interested in the archaeology um, and preserving what's worth preserving and revealing what's worth revealing and so on um, but i don't think we're we can say anything about it yet because we don't do just so no if, and if if that were the case it's the any kind of alterations that had been going before the Historic District Commission. Yeah, I think it would actually come before the HDC right. and the Historical right. Commission and maybe even you folks. It would right. go back to the right. town basically to say, okay, we found you know, X. What do you what do you say? Peter, does so that I, your concern? If I, one follow-up question is so if I look at exhibit E mm -hmm. in terms of restrictions. It specifically references landscaping, yeah, and uh, in terms of minor nature. So, um, so I guess again, what that would that would that would refer to existing landscaping. I guess I was thinking more about historic um, uh, preservation landscaping. I think I think it's true that in, for what I would say is what you're looking at now would essentially remain as is if we came back and wanted to build you know, a barn or something, that would be a major alteration to the property. Minor stuff would be lawn mowing, pruning, plantings, that sort of thing. Does, does that answer the question, Peter? Do you know what I mean? Yep, yeah, it does. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, Tom Kearns. Yeah, thanks, Diane. Uh, mine's minor, uh, nice job team. 
I think it's a great set of documents. You've worked hard. And I just, um, my very minor comment is when I open my, at least my file, the, the PR, the file name seems to, it still references Nantucket Preservation Restriction dash Athenaeum. And so just as, as you move forward, maybe just a little edit there, that's all. But I, I you know, nice set of documents. Uh, thanks so much for doing all the good work. And Tom, you remind me what I should have said to open this meeting, which is uh, thank you uh, to the First Parish and the good work you've done to with Lynn and Peter and Tom to, to put together all of this, to present it to the Historic Commission, which we have been urging, but now has been so successful. And I think you know, that has taken a lot of work, a lot of diligence and a lot of patience. So um, thank you very much. I should have said that right from the get-go. So con consider that's how I opened the meeting. <laughs> Imagine <I'll take> it. <laughs> we opened the meeting. Okay, are there other questions or comments? Okay. Um, I, I, think, <clears throat> I think that concludes. Uh, the, the reimbursement request is next, um, Tom. Well, there... Diane, we, we do need a, a motion okay. to approve the preservation restriction and attachments um, as drafted or with the, the discussed amendment. Thank you. Um, may I hear a motion? Tom? Uh, Diane, I move that we approve the historic preservation restriction as presented on April 26, 2022. Um, for the property at 6 Lexington Road um, um, as presented and with the comments made herein. Thank you very much. Do I hear a second to that motion? Second. Thank you. Um, I'm now gonna take a roll call vote. Tom? Yes. Hi, Paul? Yes. Peter? Yes. Burton? Yes. Charles? Yes. John? Yes. Sarah? Aye. I, I'm also an aye, and so it is unanimous, and I so declare. Thank you Thank all you. so much. Fantastic. Thank you all very much. This is very Thank you very much. Port milestone for us. You know, no, this is really exciting, actually. Um, <laughs> I guess I could say phew. <laughs> Just few, does few count? Is it a formal, <laughs> as a formal statement? <laughs> okay. It's a long um, journey this night to get here. Oh I'm so glad we are here, and uh, and I, I'm excited about what the next phase, you know, is that we get focus our attention on, on design and character. So, um, and and I want to also just thank. I got to have really want to say this because Lynn and her team, Bill and Doug and others. I've just been fantastic to work with that we're, we're heavily into our project. I uh, thank them for putting this as a major attention among a lot of other things that they have on their plate uh, to make to meet this deadline, which is so important to, to us and to you all. Um, so Lynn, personally, I want to say thank you from the board and the, and the public, it's a public record. You've done a great job. And I'll, Nadia, in her absence as well, is an amazing amount of work and to get us to where we are. So it's been a, it's just a great pleasure, and I want to thank you all for your support. Well, this will make a big difference at the town meeting, I think, Tom. Mm -hmm. And you are presenting a document, I believe. You're putting a document on the table at town meeting, right? I am. I, I, I had to have said it called a frequently asked questions. Um, somebody pointed out to me, I was, you know, after I sent it to you all, that there was no reference to the preservation restriction in that piece. So I made a small <laughs> edit to that document and included under funding um, a statement that says we're working with the town to develop a preservation restriction to protect the historic fabric, you know, something of the nature you know, in, that, in that document. So it's a make sure it was included and a few other small changes. Um, and you have had that approved by Carmen Reese, right? I, yes, I have. Yes. Yeah. And I made 500 copies and it's ready to go. Good, terrific. And those small changes, um, she uh, she can be informed of those, but I suspect if they're minor, and they are, yep. uh, that she will say, go ahead and, and all as well. Yep. John? Well, it sounds like I'm always making um, suggestions that 
or too late. Um, I think, Tom, the print is very small. Uh -huh. And uh, people pick this stuff up at town meeting. They want to read quickly. Right. Right. So I don't know. Whether, maybe it's too late to make a bigger print. It's well, very, awesome. very well done and extremely Thank informative. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, I know. And um, I try to keep it to four pages. Uh, it was hard. <laughs> that's, that's, you, you go, you, the, you know, to make it a 12 point font, which is what would have gone into like five and a half pages. And so I had to shrink it a little bit in order to make it do that. So um, never mind. I'll bring a magnifying glass that I can loan to anyone who needs to see it. Everybody <laughs> just bring an extra pair of reading glasses, right? To the person sitting <laughs> yeah. next to them. Give <laughs> their kids to read to them. You know. At least you can bold the questions. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, now, um, oh, yes, Peter. There's one final question. You know, I'm looking at the restriction itself, and it it looks like the signatures are going to be the uh, by the select board. Um, also, the Massachusetts Historical Commission, and I believe First Parish. So, um, is our approval of this necessary or relevant? Since so we're not your approval was a condition of um, allocating or recommending funding at town meeting on Sunday. Oh, okay. That's what I understood, Peter. Yeah, uh, that, that I think that's right. That's right. And that's yeah. going to be essential to the town meeting on 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 Sunday. Um, and we will get to that later in our meeting. <laughs> so, as I understand it, and Heather may you know, correct me, Mark. This now with after this, it now goes to the town council, and it also goes to the first parish congregation. And on June 5th, the first parish congregation, this, this document is going to be put before the congregation. Um, the senior minister, the, the head of the standing committee are all in favor of it. So it's not likely to, you know, it's not going to be a problem. But it's what when when the building was um, bequeathed, if you will, to first parish in 1885, um, it was a congregational vote to accept it. And yeah. this is such a um, dramatic, frankly, and I've, I've made a point to tell Philip Vander, you know, uh, uh, Vander Weldon, you know, Howard Dana, and and uh, Liz Rust, the people who are in various parties within the First Parish, that this is a very strategic, this is a very significant document, it, and it puts a real in place, puts in place some really important and and serious uh, restrictions that will last forever, and therefore they felt it was necessary to to, to take to the congregation. But the congregation is very excited about this. And I've had lots of conversations with people and about doing this and knowing that the importance of this and terms are moving forward. Um, I always wonder whenever you have to just, you know, somebody's out still out there to have to do whatever. So it, I get a little worried about, you know, sometimes on, uh, on this, but um, I think it's, a, it's gonna be the important the congregational vote will be a demonstration of a commitment of First Parish to moving forward with this. And so, I'm actually quite excited by the opportunity to, to do that. But then after I'm that, it then, it then okay. goes to the select board, needs to approve it. And then after that, it then goes to the Mass Historic Commission for their review and approval. Okay. I think those are the steps, if I'm correct, about how, how it proceeds from there. So there's a, and there may be small edits like we just talked about tonight um, that may need to spin back through. Um, I don't expect it, but we'll see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, Tom, in a, in a note to me and a letter to the, the group, um, you suggested that this is the last of the requests that First Parish will make on behalf of the Wright Tavern. Um, and in my public presentation, um, most recently, I was able to so declare, does that remain a commitment on the part of Wright Tavern or do you anticipate future funding needs? Um, let me put this way. Great, that's a great question, Diane. Um, I, I never want to say never on anything. <laughs> so, so, so never maybe is a little strong word. Um, our desire is to, I mean, the, the town is, is amazingly generous. So it's like, it's close to half a million dollars. I mean, it's just phenomenal. And, uh, the, and but we're expecting the total cost of this project to be a million and a half to two million dollars. So, so I don't want to put the town in that kind of commission and the funding that you all have you know there's many many good re uh, reasons for other things so 
we're therefore going to be initiating a sort of major capital campaign starting the fall and really for ne next year that hopefully will raise the other, I'll call it a million and a half. And then even more in order to create funding for long-term supportive programs and staffing and whatnot. Um, so our hope is that we won't need to, and we're trying to get the, the right tavern on its own footing. So it's self-sustaining mm -hmm. and, and any kind of major work that needs to be done, assume it all gets approved by the various parties, but all be self-funded. You mean to rent you we mean know that you're here, so it's not a never. It's just a statement of, of preference through rental, for it. through rental income, Tom. Pardon me. Um, it it be through ticket sales, uh, through programs that we will be okay. hosting. Uh, we want to do room rental because we want to host a lot of events dealing with democracy in the place. Um, we're looking to if we can create what you're hoping to do to create a fairly large endowment, then we could use returns off of the endowment. You mm -hmm. put those those uh, and and then uh, annual fundraising campaign. So you put those five sources. It, the budget may be somewhere. Uh, we're going to perform a budget that's around eight hundred thousand dollars once it gets kind of up and operational over the next five years. So in, in year five, it may be somewhere between eight hundred thousand and a million dollars. Um, once again, this is with great ideas and you know reality will 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 burn it, it will show itself. But so we expect the the funding should cover those expenses. Uh, for operating operations, um, both the capital campaign for getting the place to what we want to be, and then all these other operational things, um, ticket sales and book sales, and a lot of other things you may kind of do. So, and, and speaking engagements and events and all that sort of stuff. So, and you know, Tom, I, I would recommend that you turn to experts in grant writing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I know this is not an original thought, but I mean, there there are, I'm sure, grants for this, particularly given the provenance of this building, um, yeah. that, that might be you know, absolutely right. Very very supportive of your endeavors. Okay. As, as soon as I can, I want to get the board out of doing the work we're doing here. We need to just be run by professionals, and, right? You know, and that's what we're that's what we're trying to get to. But we're a startup, and you know, you got to get to the point where you get to the point <laughs> okay. you can generate enough funding and support that you can hire people to do those kinds right. of things. So exactly. yeah, I totally, totally agree with you, Diane, totally agree. Uh, well, thank you, Tom. Stuart Saganor has had warned Heather and myself in a, in, a, in a lengthy conversation that sometimes these projects are you know, very well-meaning and it looks like it's going to be just fine, but then if the funding is not forthcoming, then you're you're kind of between a rock and a hard place. And right. in order to speak about this at, in, in town meeting with integrity, I wanted to ask that question so that I could right. say, I believe I can now say that, that the intention is to be able to, to make every, to borrow the Harvard phrase, every tub on its own bottom, um, mm -hmm. that this will be a tub that is able to go forward, but um, that of course, you know, all such future funding depends upon the capacity to be, to, to do exacting fund, successful fundraising. Does that sound like a, a fair that's, statement? That's a, that's a good response, yeah, thank okay, you. Thank yeah. you very much, all right. Um, other questions from anyone? Um, Okay, Tom and, and Lynn and Peter, terrific. Now we do have some questions about the um, reimbursement process. Diane, John has his hand. Raised. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I, I, just, I just wanted, um, Tom, are you sticking around for discussion of the grant conditions? Sure. Yeah. In the MOUs? Yeah, because I have a question when we get there. Oh, okay. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Do you want to exercise that now so that Peter and Lynn and Tom can get about their, their lives, John? I mean, that's kind of out of order, but, but. Well, it actually relates to the next topic anyway, which is whether you anticipated, and maybe Heather knows the answer, can legal, um, whether you anticipated legal expenses going forward, because I don't see it in the current list on the, on the conditions, um, A, you know, a through looks like one through 12. And since we have a dispute now about a current set of legal bills and whether they fall within the first grant, I didn't know whether you thought it was important to have legal expenses in the second grant. I believe it is in the second grant. I mean, I don't have it in front of me. Um, and if not, we do have independent sources so we can cover that. If there's a dispute, I'd rather not um, you know, it's, it's it was part it was necessary to develop the, the the PR. Obviously, I know it was not included in the first grant. So that is, I think, because we didn't have didn't anticipate that when we were 
had applied for funding back in 2021 or 2020, I guess it was. Right. Oh. Yeah, so John, we did discuss this at a, a previous meeting when we were discussing draft um, conditions for projects. Um, and we did, it was um, listed as a line item for legal expenses for the preservation restriction um, in this year's application. Um, but we had said that by the time this year's application is funded, the PR is going to be complete um, and drafted because we just approved it tonight. So that's why we eliminated it from this year's list of fundable expenses. Right. Right. Does that make sense to you, John and, and to Tom? No. Well, it doesn't make sense in the sense that it could be paid out of this money if Tom wanted it going retroactively. Um, I'd rather be um, clean in terms of what we had agreed to early on. So there's okay. no challenge. And we're not, we're, we've got some, you know, funding from outside sources and from the trustees. So I think we're fine. Okay, fine. I just want to be sure. I just want to be sure we didn't have this same debate next year. Right. No. Nope. But now next year could be different because <laughs> next year it, it is included in, in the if, if it you know going forward. Right. Well, it's that. not. It's not in this list in the next grant unless oh. it's under historical preservation advisors, which it was, which that included. Um, you know, architects, advisors, legal, I forget what else I had in here. I mean, I just don't have it in front of me, but. I mean, the word legal is not in the list and yeah. I just wanted to avoid a debate next to, next year. If you, if you, if, you're, if the church is trying to, you know, the same as we're in now, the church gets a bill for legal expenses, pays it and sends it to Heather. It won't right. be Heather, but Heather's successor. Right, right. So are you comfortable that that's ambiguous at best when it says historical preservation advisors? I am. No. Okay. Um, and once again, I think um, if there's concerns about it, uh, the committee we can exclude it because we have other sources to pay for that. Okay. But if, if it could, it would be, it'd be great because it, It'll have, that money would be allocated to something else. So whatever makes sense. So then our, our John, are you recommending an emendation to their present application? I think it would be cleaner and clearer if it does say historical preservation advisors, including legal assistance. I, I think it would need to be more specific about legal assistance because how does legal assistance relate to the category of historic preservation? So if the, the project is only fundable under the category of historic preservation, preservation, you would need to be specific about the, the legal services. So in, in their list, in their original application, they had legal services for the preparation of the preservation restriction, which at this point has been drafted and will be approved, you know, has been approved prior to funding being allocated at town meeting. So that's why we decided at a previous meeting that it made sense to just take it off. All right. <laughs> it, it, we'll just, it could, could be put back in and the bills could be paid out of the new grant. I don't think the fact that we just re re approved it doesn't change the fact that you could be reimbursed retroactively for the, for the work done to get it drafted and approved. So. I think that's the discussion the committee needs to have because the original approval, what the drafting of the PR was a condition of approving the funding for that grant last year. Um, the CPC did not agree to fund the drafting of the PR when they made it a condition last year. So I think that's a, a question and discussion the committee needs to have if at this point, you want to retroactively pay for that versus pay, use the funds for the intended purpose in the original application. John, do you understand? I'm sure you understand that distinction. Are you comfortable with that distinction? I am, yeah. John? No, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm only trying to help the project get its legal expenses covered 
if they want them covered. Um, yep. If they don't want them covered and they think they have other sources, so be it. Okay. Well, I, I just want to be sure we don't have this debate in another year. Another year. Right. We didn't have language because they thought it was going to be covered and the language wasn't good enough for Heather. Or not just for Heather, but for the, the, the basic principle of the, of the application. Um, it, Tom, I, I think perhaps, you know, some language tweaking um, is, is not unimportant. Right. And, and just to make certain that in the future, uh, certainly not for the things that we've asked you to do, which you, the, the, the costs you had to incur yourself, but some language tweaking may be, may be suggested after our meeting because we're going to have to discuss this as a committee, okay? Okay, that's great. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. All right. Does that make sense to everybody? Well, I don't think, are we going to vote on conditions tonight? Yeah, I think we're voting on many of them, I think, John. We'll see how Yeah, we so go. I don't know how you could do this one without understanding what the language would be that would give them some legal expenses related to historic preservation. Unless they want to just waive that idea. And, and realize that they would not get legal fees in the future. If there are outstanding questions, um, we can put it off to the, the May meeting to approve the grant agreement. It just means that they wouldn't have access to their funding until the grant agreement is finalized and signed. But funding's technically not available until July 1st anyways, so it would, we would still have time. John, does that make sense to you? And Tom, do you understand? So, so, so what I appreciate concern, John, around the, the funding, I would rather um, just from a point of clarity and to let us move forward, allow us to assume the cost of the legal fees. It weren't that much and we have plenty of funding for that. That enables us to, the money that potentially would have been allocated that to use for other things that we're gonna need for the building. Cause there's, there's a lot of work still needs to go in the building. So. Right. It's about left pocket, right pocket. So I think just from a, a clarity point of view, um, it, it because the, the statement that we had made earlier was that the legal services were for the present, were for the development of the preservation restriction. In the future, there may be legal services related to contracts or to other kinds of things not related to the preservation restriction. And we'll have to find funding for those sort those services. And I'll include that, uh, the, these legal services in that. So. I'm quite comfortable with keeping the legal services for the preservation of the PR, preparation of the PR out of this since it's not included in, the, in those statements. I thought it had been, but it, if it's not, I don't know if it's in front of me, but if it's not included, then that's fine. Uh, it's not a big deal one way or the other. I, I just want to make, I'd love, I'd like for us to get clarity and sort of, you know, and move forward. Thank you, Tom. John, is this okay with you? I, 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 I'm just remain concerned that if he has legal services for other contracts and to pay for other type of legal work, he doesn't have sufficient language, given the problem we're having with the first grant, he doesn't have clear enough language to get those reimbursed, even if they're not for the preservation restriction. But my sense is that what Tom is saying is that they have enough resources within the community to cover those legal costs. Now, if he understands that everything legal going forward, no matter what it's for, will be covered outside this grant, then I think he's that you don't need new language. That's my sense. Tom, is that correct? That, that is correct. All right. Thank you very much. Sarah, you had your hand up. I'm not necessary anymore. Thank you. Are you sure? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Um, now um, we move on now to a committee deliberation. Um, and Peter, I hope we're not wandering in the in the wilderness for forty days and forty nights, as you mentioned last Sunday. That we're not out there <laughs> scoping around here. But um, sorry, I didn't mean to bring that analogy forward. I, I know that was a great analogy. I thought uh, so. The right tavern reimbursement request. Um, uh, it, 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 do you want to move us, work us through this, Heather, a little bit, please? Yeah, um, if it'd be helpful, I can share my screen as well. Yeah, that would be prudent. Um, so we did receive um, a, a, the first reimbursement request from Wright Tavern, um, and I did not feel comfortable making that decision on my own. Um, I consulted with Nancy as the treasurer and Diane as the chair. Um, and together, the three of us were not comfortable making that decision, and we thought that it needs a 
full committee discussion. Um, so there were four invoices that Wright Tavern has paid that they've submitted reimbursements for. Um, one of them was for legal expenses for the preservation restriction, which um, as I mentioned earlier, was not part of the original um, application. So it was not listed in the grant agreement as a fundable expense. It was a condition of the, the grant. Um, so I do not believe that is um, fundable as a reimbursement request. And then the other three invoices um, are labeled as architectural design. Um, and Wright Tavern has provided us the contracts with um, Nishadak Architects. Um, and it says that they are preparing construction documents. And I think it kind of toes the line of whether that qualifies for funding under the list, um, whether construction documents that are being prepared in order to do some of the fundable work um, qualifies under um, item I, which is the consultation services um, from a historic preservation architect. Um, so that's, I just wanted to bring it to the full committee for a discussion on whether this qualifies for reimbursement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. May I hear any uh, opinions from our, uh, from our board, please? Well, there's not a single hand raised. Okay, Paul. <laughs> well, it's sort of a question. <clears throat> Why would the, the preparation of a design document not be considered consultation services? Generally, um, like con the development of construction documents is a listed item as a, a fundable part of a project. Um, so for example, um, uh, Aspet River Pedestrian Bridge, the some different projects um, list out that they're for development of construction documents, development of um, permitting documents, that sort of thing. Um, and that's not specifically listed here. Um, so the question is whether the committee believes that falls under consultation services. And this, this, is, this gets exactly, I think, to the discussion we were just having between John and Tom about, um, as in Tom Wilson, about the, um, uh, and John Kratzley, about the, the nature of language that is embedded in the application and cleaving or hewing to that language. Peter? Well, let me just continue. I, I, I don't, in reading, oh, let's go ahead. In reading number one, I, I don't see why that would not fit under services rendered by either an architect, a structural engineer, or, you know, I think plans are part and parcel of part of those services, but that's just my opinion. Thank you, Paul. Peter? Peter, do you know we can't hear you? You're on mute. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I would agree with Paul in terms of the um, architectural designs. I mean, I'm looking at consultation services, includes preservation architect, structural engineer, and architectural conservator. So it seems that that would, would, would cover that. But, but maybe I'm, I'm misinterpreting. In terms of the um, preservation restriction, it's pretty clear in the grant agreement uh, from last year, it says the grantee is responsible for all costs associated with drafting and recording the preservation restriction. So I think that was, that was pretty clearly laid out in the conditions. And you do not feel that the particular um, architectural design efforts were in, in um, support of that effort? Well, if, again, if I'm looking at the document right in front of us, consultation services does seem to encompass um, architectural services. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, I think that with the, when it comes to the, um, preservation uh, restriction that was pretty clearly spelled out in, in uh, yes. the conditions um, from last year's recommendation. You're, exact, you're exactly right. Um, Tom Wilson, do you have a comment? Yes, I received a, a letter this morning uh, um, from Josh Bass, who was uh, the person at the Nishotic Architects, just detailing the, the, the time and the activities related to those descriptions under, under the uh, 
architectural design. It wasn't doing construction drawings. It wasn't that nature. It was the uh, it was the analysis of the uh, roof structure and working with Brian Walsh, who was a structural engineer, with and and Larry Sorley having meetings with them, reviewing documents, reviewing letters back and forth, kind of looking at what is what's the right um, work that needs to be done in terms of scope and activities related to 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 the um, repair in the in the roof structure. So it's it it wasn't doing design as an architect doing design. It was the it was the consultation. Services to, preservation, to, yes. to, to do the work to figure out what you're going to do, that's kind of thing. So that, it, that's why it was, uh, you know, perhaps the word architectural design is a, implied a, um, you know, so rendering some sort of drawings. Actually, it was the, it was the analysis and the examination and the consultation and the meetings um, that was involved in his activities. Thank you, Tom. Um, are there other comments from members of the committee or other thoughts? Heather, do you have anything that you would like to add? Okay. No, um, no, I think that that helped clarify things, Tom. Thank you. Okay. Hearing, I hearing. Send this to you, uh, I can, Heather, I'll send this to you. Okay. This thing from Josh, just so you see what it, I'm talking about. Thank you. So, hearing none, um, may I have a motion to uh, fund the items one, three, and four? of the Wright Tavern, which means the Nishotic, Nishotic um, Architects Inc. $173.58 for architectural design in July and August of 2021. The same firm again, $83.49 for design services, architectural design in 2021. Uh, and again, the same firm for $558.02 for architectural design, November, 2021. Um, may I hear support for those three items financially um, for us to support those, um, to, to sign the checks to support that? Could somebody please so move? So moved. Thank Oops, you. Sorry, Burton. Thank you, Burton. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Thank you. Um, Tom, yes? Yes. Hey. Sarah? Yes. Aye. Aye. Peter? Yes. Okay, Charles. Okay. Paul. Yes. John. Um, yeah, uh, Heather, if you would mark that I recused myself from the vote, uh, my wife still has a modest interest in the Shotic Architects. Uh, okay, thank you very much, John. Burton. Yes. Okay, and I, I also. So, um, thank you very much, and the checks will be so cut for you guys. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Um, uh, the discussion of the uh, upcoming 2020 um, annual meeting. Um, I mentioned last time, <laughs> Burton, don't laugh. <laughs> um, I'm going to say good night. Thank oh, you. good night, Lynn. Thank you so much for <laughs> coming. Interesting. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us. And I, I don't know if you're going to be sticking around, Tom, but I think we're, we're in pretty good shape. Um, um, so, um, we can always get back to you if we're not, but it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to affect the town meeting vote and things. So if you, okay. you all want to enjoy your evening or else you're more than welcome to join us or stay with us. <laughs> well, well, thank right. you. Thank you. I, I learn a lot from these meetings. So I've, I really appreciate it. And we learned a lot it's, from you, Lynn, so. it's a real pleasure to work with Tom and Peter and the Legacy Trust. Uh, lots of enthusiasm and it's a great building. So we're very honored to be involved. Thank you so much. Right back at you. Okay. All right. Good night, folks. Good night now. Good night, folks. Good night. Um, in the in the annual meeting, um, I I having now r run this um by uh the the by citizens at the public hearing, there were lots of questions that emerged, and at our last meeting, um, and I I believe uh, John, you were in Spain. <laughs> on the coast of Spain and France. And, you know, we had a, we had a very quick and, and brief discussion of all this. And I, Sarah, I think you weren't, you weren't there, but let me just say that each of these items has caused discussion of one kind or another. Um, and so I, I, I don't know whether the best thing to do is to just quickly go through each one for a minute and highlight the areas where I think there might be questions. Would that be helpful to everyone or is it unnecessary? So I'd like to hear from everybody. 
if it would help you, then definitely yep. you go through it. It, wow. it might also be helpful if any of us at town meeting yep. felt yep. the need to speak, to speak up as well as the as our chair. Okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna need all the help I can get. I can assure you. Um, I okay. Let's let's start. Um, I'm just gonna run through them very quickly. Now, I've been practicing to get it down to seven minutes, and Carmen Reese and I have been working on this. The way it will happen is I won't read the whole um, uh, the the whole uh, it, uh, uh, charge, the whole article, but I will read each one of them. And what I've done is to go through and figure out how much money, although that's not so listed, what's listed is the amount they applied for and the amount we're granting. And then, so there's gonna be a coefficient between that. So I've gone back and done the rudimentary mathematics of that so that I can remind people of how other people are contributing. But the Town of Concord Regional Housing Services produces no questions. Uh, the Concord Home for the Aged, 110 Walden. Um, we've had questions and Paul, you've anticipated those about whether you know, they have the funding to do this. This has been a multi-funding process. Uh, what about the painting of the building? Isn't that something they should do on their own? Those questions have emerged in our public hearings and we've been able to address those um, by talking about the, um, the, the, the fact that, those, that that painting is not just superficial painting, but it's, you know, it's really the care of the, of the structure itself to that painting. Um, and, and that this is the last of a four-year project. Charles, does that meet with your expectations about how to present this? Because this is really in your wheelhouse. So, sounds good, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the trustees, think, first, I, go ahead, Heather. Oh, sorry, I think one thing to note about the, the paint is that paint helps protect the historic wood fabric. Right. Which is, obviously in all of these old structures, very important. Thank you. Keep, keep it coming. <laughs> okay. well, well, also, Diane, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, there is significant cost sharing and the committee in you know, our deliberations have asked them to take on additional cost sharing, which they are. So uh, you know, it's not, it's not um, and it's historic, important historical building right. and it's the end of a four, four year cycle. So I think it'll Absolutely. fit together, yeah. Thank you, Paul. Uh, uh, the old man's, um, the only concern I've heard there, again, is question of painting, which goes right back to Heather's point. But also, you know, what about the National Trust? Don't they have enough money to pay for this? Why are we paying for it at all? And, um, and so that does come up. Um, I suspect that given all the issues at town meeting, and there are many, that this will not be a major issue, nor will any little finger be raised because it's not a vast amount of money that we're putting into that $38,000, I don't think will cause a kerfluffle at, at town meeting. Um, the right tavern, however, uh, a variety of questions have emerged and the major question, um, and Linda's on this call, so I hope Linda will help me with this. Linda, where, where I miss a point that is important in terms of public discourse, I hope you will say something. Um, yes, no, maybe? Yeah, yeah, yes, I will. In your discussions right now, yeah, of course. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, in the right tavern, the, the, the question has been, uh, you know, how much of this building will be public? Will they have public access? You know, is this something we're just paying so that, a, a, you know, a small little building of some consequence um, is going to be used just by, by the parish for what are by private architecture firms or whatever. Um, and so this has come up uh, several times in various deliberations. And I, you, you can see by the handout, and this was a recommendation that, that I made to the folks that they ought to put a substantive handout to have a town meeting, to talk about the history of this building, to talk about its usage, and to talk about the way it's going to be used in the future. And I think, um, as, as with our own deliberations, not as a defense of this, but as an honest deliberations on our part, uh, that, that this is going to be a building to which the public will have access. It will be a museum. It will be a, a way of working itself into the narrative about Concord and its battle with Lexington over this, uh, you know, Congress position at the at the um, in, in terms of revolutionary prominence um, uh, and um, perhaps provenance. 
So does that make sense to everyone? Can you hear any problems with that? Okay. Yeah, well, Diane, I Diane. also, it's not just the, the time of um, April 19th, it's the Provincial Congress. Right. A year before. A year before. And that's what they're trying to ready it for. Exactly. The, um, mm -hmm. the handout actually references a reenactment of that Provincial Congress. I know it does, That's which is amazing. Thank you, John. It's written right there yeah. in English for me. Thank you. I, and I would agree, Diane, in terms of broad public access, I mean, they're they're obligated and they've committed to it. Right. So I don't think there's any question that that's going to be a priority. Okay. But that was a big question at the public hearing. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure. okay. Concord Free Public Library, we get no pushback on that one. I mean, everybody says hooray, hooray. Um, so that's that's good. Um, and ironically, even with even though I've urged for, for some information about more funding from the library, what I have just done is in a, in a kind of a parenthetical statement said that, of course, the library has been supporting this for a long time before this particular request has come forward. Um, OK, um, the uh, Aspect River Bluff Preservation Housing Land Acquisition. Well, for heaven's sake, this has become a, uh, a, a major issue, but it, is, it now appears that the grant request that Delia Kay has written uh, has, is going to come through and that's an additional $500,000. And, and that will offset so many of the costs. I don't yet know whether it's going to yield kickback to our committee. There is ongoing discussion with the select board as to where that money um, will go? Will it go to to re to, in, to kind of um, because, for instance, there's been a lot of fundraising over nine hundred thousand dollars of fundraising. This may lead us in excess of the amount of money it costs to buy this land. Uh, so the the question is, will that money go to uh, 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 the the uh, resources natural resources committee for for use in, in future development of, the, of trails in the land will it go to the town to reimburse their expenditures will it go to the concord housing development uh com corporation and their commitment and or will it come back to us it's my understanding and linda help me with this one my understanding is that is yet to be absolutely clearly defined <clears throat> So I think the clearest statement that can be made at this point <laughs> is that to the extent um, that there are excess uh, funds raised through the fundraising um, aspect of this, that they will be dedicated to um, primarily to stewardship of the land. Okay, that was my sense too, Linda, but there was also discussion about free cash and other things. Sure, I, I've heard those, but uh, this, this, um, I'm making this statement as of late this afternoon's discussion. Ah, ah, always, it's always good to have an insider, isn't it, on a meeting? <laughs> okay. Uh, oh. Diane, Diane or Linda, could you, could you explain the, so the two aren't articles. Yes, they uh, are. And I, I understand the differences, I think. Um, <laughs> Congratulations, Paul. I've only spent a thousand hours on this. Go ahead. Does Delia's successful grant application have a bearing on the first one, the second one, or or both? The first one. The first one. Okay. Our uh, money. So our money is a clear a million dollars. Boom. Right. The question was the twenty Article Twenty Five, um, and the funding for that, and so, but. It precedes our, our, our meeting, Paul. It precedes our presentation and therefore giving us as much information in advance of that, I thought was, was, was important. I should also tell you, Paul, that I've been informed that the people that are presenting 25 cannot be there on Monday night. Oh. So the CPC article will be presented on Sunday, um, you know, re regardless of anything else because they can't be there to talk about 25. So no, what will happen with 25? Um, Presuming that 25 can now sit, you know, every tub on its own bottom again can, can be perfectly, can be well-funded. Um, and it will be from what this, from what we now know, um, then, then it should probably sail through. Um, the county. Diane, if, I'm, if I may make one point, I believe, and I'm not an expert on this, I believe that the grant that Delia has gotten is a grant that can reimburse so, that's the, exactly right. so, so the town 
our article 25 needs to pass for the town to expend the money and then the grant could reimburse the town That's after exactly. the fact yeah so so the entire project you will explain the entire project the, you're the spokesperson for this project no delia k and or carrie lafleur uh, will be presenting 25 and oh, okay. so that when we come up, this will still be an issue. Um, and, and so I just, you know, although I will be reading it aloud, the, the heart of that, of that information, Paul, will be the, the I, I think the weight of that will be carried by other something, but somebody other than our committee. You know, blessedly, because with this grant coming through, the, the questions that are out there, however, um, one of the major questions that has surfaced every time we brought this up is whether there's enough affordable housing. Uh, you know, five units of affordable housing, was that and is that sufficient? And I have since, I've recently learned, and I will again rely and lean on Linda's expertise and knowledge, uh, in an executive committee early in the fall, uh, I believe our town manager said that we would have 11 affordable housing units. Well, the truth of the matter is we won't have 11 affordable housing units. So that when it they learned, when they, meaning the select board learned, that the final adjudication of this meant that we would have five affordable houses as opposed to 11. I don't know how anyone imagined that there would be 11 affordable houses on that property, but nonetheless, uh, there became the hewn cry from Mary Hartman, from FinCom, and then from Matt Johnson and and others, including Terry on the select board. And Linda, of course, has been, I just wanna thank her because she's been an extraordinarily gracious anchor through all of this. But at any rate, um, a, a concern that we, are, we don't have enough affordable housing on this, on this lands, on this spot. Um, the uh, Keith Bergman and, and Charles and the, the, the Housing Trust has spoken, spoken to this and supported it. Um, but it may come up again in the town meeting. So let, let's go around. Peter, then Burton, then Paul, then Charles. Oh, I just had a quick question. Um, so are you saying Article 26 is going to come up on Sunday? Yes, for sure. And 25 as, as well? well? Because that's the one where the Assabet River um, Trust folks who cannot be there Monday night can be there on Sunday. So Carmen Reese has anchored these two motions into an assured coverage on Sunday. Okay, and I have a question we may wanna hold off on until we get to the condition. It's about the condition, should I hold off on that? Go, well, go ahead and ask, sure. I may, go ahead. For this project? Well, um, for this, this project, there were a, a number of proposals put forward and um, the conditions don't reference specifically which of the proposals is, um, is being recommended. And I guess my thought was that it was concept plan 7A dated December 20, 2021, that seemed to be the, the plan that um, people most coalesced around. And I'm, my question is, I'm assuming you know, this is the uh, the concept plan. It is. That will be relevant to this specific recommendation, and, and maybe I'm mistaken. Well, um, I, I don't have those documents, and I can't toggle them up, Peter, with the electric you, that you have done that. Um, I don't have a separate screen so that I can pull that up and look at it. But the the way it it eventually comes out is that there's there are two houses. There, there's one property there that is two affordable houses. And then there will be additional houses built that will create uh, three more additional affordable houses, which means in the aggregate, five affordable houses in about 30% of the land, the 70% of the land, the other 70% of the land will be delegated to natural resources. So it's a 30, 70, I believe it's a 30, 70 split, Heather. Yeah, so the the thirty seventy split is is um, in the grant agreement. Um, so this funding is for the land acquisition, not for the the project, you know, specifically. Um, so I, I I would hazard against 
um, conditioning it on a specific concept plan because it's a concept plan and that changes. Um, and um, B, it's more for the land acquisition for the project. And so we're making sure that 30% of the land is going towards um, community housing and 70% of the land is going towards open space and that meets our requirements for CPC at this point for the land acquisition. That's gorgeously and clearly put Heather as always. Peter, does that make sense to you? Yes, it does. Okay, thank you very much. Burton. Thank you, Diane. If, if I, I wanna maybe help clear up some of the, the what I think resulted in some, some people's noses getting bent here on this. So going back to November, I was involved at that time and, and discussed this with the chair, the select board, and was aware of what had been put forward by the, uh, the, the Department of Land uh, Management and Planning in terms of what could be done on the project. And the idea was an 11 unit planned residential development. John and I being on the planning board knows what that means. It's, it's, a, it's an alternative model of, of development in lieu of a subdivision plan. And in town we have, when you build a planned residential development, we have a, an affordable housing uh, requirement. So if you build um, a 10 unit development, 20% of the units need to be affordable. <laughs> It was put forward that they that that, uh, to, that an eleven unit PRD planned residential development could be built there. That would have resulted in exactly two affordable units and nine market rate units. Um, the the land trusts that were funding this project said we're not in the business of real estate development. That doesn't make sense to us. Let's get back to the table and figure out a way that meets affordable housing requirements, preserves land, and 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 comes to good compromise. The compromise is that they're that they that they're setting aside five unit they're, they're to build five units of housing. Now, the truth of the matter is, is that those units then need to be paid for. In a PRD, the developer would be responsible for paying for them and delivering them constructed. Obviously, they can do that without having to pay the the, the prevailing wage law and all of that. And so that's great. You get two units fully delivered. What we're instead getting is a, an existing two-family home, which will be converted to a, an affordable, yeah. affordable housing that will be eligible for our um, uh, subsidized housing inventory. And then fundraising or additional funds would need to be put together to three. So right. this, the conception that we went from 11 to five is that was, I think maybe perhaps, and I hate to point fingers when somebody's not around, but perhaps a miscommunication on the part of the town manager. Linda, feel free to correct me, but this is my understanding of how things unfolded. And so in fact, coming up with five affordable units was an improvement from that original proposal. And that's my sense as well, but it ended up being present, it ended up being translated to those of us who were not in the executive committee yes, or did. part of that closed door planning as a compromise. <laughs> and a rather serious compromise as opposed to an, a step forward in yeah. terms of what, what we could achieve. Uh, Linda, would you correct any of this? <laughs> no, uh, no I, I appreciate what Burden just said. And, and I, but I also want to add an additional context, which is to remind everybody that the select board unanimously approved Article 25. So dis, despite- we're, we're grateful. <laughs> Despite the robust discussion, which is always important to have, uh, there was unanimous uh, 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 support of Article 25. So I think um, it's good to bring uh, to put provide that context for earlier conversations because there's been many conversations over many months. So and thank you. My reason, Linda, for bringing them up is that they may come up at town meeting. Because you know, it was not just you, myself, Burton, and a few other people who heard all of this. It's, yeah. <laughs> you know, I could. They, I could they, they, yeah. they may, but I think there are um, significant um, designated individuals prepared, like you are doing uh, in a good way right now, prepared for some of the potential questions that and and people are uh, both anticipating and ready to answer some of these, mm -hmm. and and. And, and I think the majority of them are going to come up in Article 25 before we ever get to 26. <laughs> that, that, that is my deepest hope. <laughs> not because, and I should just say, not because I'm afraid to address them, but just because it would be really lovely not to have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can appreciate that. 
Burton, that was such an articulate. Um, so I'm you're going to send me your telephone number, and I'm going to practice with you <laughs> on Saturday before before you can, Sunday. You can text me from the podium, Diane. <laughs> right. <laughs> Like, hello, you remember who you're talking to? <laughs> Actually, from the podium, <laughs> it's not going to happen in my lifetime, but um, thank you. So, I mean, just practicing that is going to be, although I really do text now. I mean, this, you know, uh, as, as a 19th century character as I am, I, I do text. <laughs> okay, Paul. Yeah, so I, I think Burton's context is really important. It's, it's, it's a level of detail uh, that's really important. And, and I think Linda's context, the select word wing is important, but I think a context that maybe you can communicate um, is the process. And, and the, the process is that in general, there've been tr tremendous amounts of discussion here. That's right. Between, between all of the relevant stakeholders, the residents, let's not forget the residents, uh, the housing stakeholders, the open space stakeholders, all, all the committees in town, extensive discussions and a balance has been struck that's exactly that, right, Paul. That gets you five um, affordable houses, but gets you open space. And importantly, the residents have bought into this. And there was tremendous, if you just look at the record of the people who originally opposed this, this was this was brought home. This is this is like this is like planes hovering over Logan in the fog. Right. This, no, is, you're, this you're was exactly landed, landed beautifully. You're exactly right, Paul. And I mean, one of the things that I hope the town has learned from this. And, and she says this full of hope, is that communicating with the neighbors when any opportunity or any change is going to take place is critical. Because if you remember the original statement to us was, and the neighbors are fine with this. And, you know, a hue and cry. And thank heavens, we, we let them come, not just come, but talk. <laughs> you know, we gave them a platform for discourse, which then in fact allowed a synergy to take place that that made a, um, I think, a much more successful outcome that might have occurred uh, than otherwise. So I mean, and, I, and I, I'll, I'll just I'll just add one more point to Burton's point. Uh, you, again, five affordable uh, housing units. The alternative that's not happening is is private development, and uh, which was is a whole nother game. And um, you're so right. Was, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I think I, you know, I I will sleep more comfortably having heard about the Delia Grant. I mean, that, you know, it still has to go through layers. I mean, there still has to be a state acceptance and other things, but it looks like it's, you know, very much going to be a consummated Probably. event. And, you know, I, I, I'm so grateful for the work that everybody has done. And Paul, your emphasis on collaboration is so important because that's been, you know, central to all of this. Charles. We're just buying the property. Right. <laughs> that's what we're doing here. Right. <laughs> You know, let's not right. talk about design of, of housing or whatever. Right. Uh, but we do talk about the the agreement that we made, I believe, which was accepted by the neighbors. Part, partly that that was partly reason to do to do five units. Yeah. But another thing to point out is that in any in rich, original um, assessment really didn't take into account uh, the geography of that of that land. Exactly. Yeah. Now that land, is, the geography, really, uh, um, I think, pretty much, uh, if we want to have responsible development, responsible to the landscape, um, there there are considerable limits due to uh, due to water, groundwater, and so forth. Exactly. That 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 said that really only that part in the corner is 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 what we should be developing. So I, I think that's an important, I mean, that's that's my opinion anyway, but that's what it looked like to me when I looked at the landscape. Well, thank you, Charles. I'm counting on each one of you to remember what you just said and to stand up in town meeting if it comes up okay. and raise your hand <laughs> and address these issues. Okay. Okay, the town of Concord, Junction Village open space. Well, believe it or not, we got some pushback on this too. Now they have they have adjusted, as you know, their application so that it's not going. They they reduced the amount of money they think they're going to need, but the two questions that have been most prominent have been one: Well, what if Junction Village isn't forthcoming or doesn't happen, you know, or doesn't get started? And of course, we've seen this kind of thing before, where we've had bank the money and then forward it to an, an organization when the operation was ready to occur. So that one is easily manageable. And then there was the comment 
that, well, don't we have enough parks over there? Haven't we spent enough on parks? Yeah. I mean, for heaven's sake, we've got Giro. We've spent millions of dollars on Giro, was supposedly, you know, kind of a generous gift to the town, not like White Pond, which was meant to be a really generous gift. But you know, in this, in this, you know, the, these costs, don't we have enough parks? Isn't there something a better way to spend our money? I did remind people that in the original Junction Village Agreement, the town said it would ameliorate, um, upgrade the parkland around. And that was an understanding right from the get go. And I was knee deep in that one, uh, in the weeds, I could say, because that's what is around it is weeds. Um, but I was knee deep in that discussion when it was happening. But those are the two concerns I've heard most often um, articulated about that project. So uh, are, is there any commentary anybody would like to add to that, John? Um, yeah, Diane and maybe Heather, what is the, what is the best we could say now about the likelihood of the Junction Village project? I don't know at this point, John. I, I don't know. I don't I, think I, that Maybe Linda has any information about that as to the, their, their, their state grant and so on? So, um, you know, it, it looks like uh, the closing may not, uh, will at the earliest would be late 22. Uh, um, but more likely early in 23 with construction to be finished in 24. That sounds like the state grant, the state monies are either promised or, or highly likely. Um, the um, Grantham group is trying to secure uh, some bridge funding because of um, escalation of construction costs. But they have not yet secured them, right, Linda? Uh, they're in the process of working that out. Yeah, uh, yeah that's it. <laughs> Hence, John. <laughs> no, I can see the difficulties of describing the current, um, the, the current level of, of, of <laughs> likelihood. Uh, sounds pretty vague. The current level of likelihood. <laughs> Well, I mean, and so this one, 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 I think we just simply comment that when it's ready um, and when Junction Village begins, then in collaboration with the, their heavy equipment and the uh, design of the, of the West Village Concord um, Advisory Committee that this project will, be, will, will go forward. And I mean, I think we can answer that one with alacrity. Uh, Paul. Yeah, I, I think I mentioned this last time, but you know, um, and, you know it's, it's a little awkward to back into a strategic plan here, but I, I think this particular project at the, the Open Junction Village, it, it stitches together some of the, the assets in town, because you have the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail going through, passing, right. passing this, you have it passing Giro, and then you have it going over, over um, Route 2. It's really, you know, it, it's part of a, a network They're of exactly open space right. recreation. Absolutely. And this is, this is one of the, uh, the other reasons why this is important. Um, it, it creates a kind of, a, both a physical and physical continuity. Um, from one end to the other. That's gorgeous. Tom and then Burton. Well, just maybe it's a question for Heather and the group, but uh, I, I guess we wouldn't bank this grant indefinitely. If 22 became 23, 23 became 24 and 25, at a certain point, I guess, you know, the next CPC would have to kind of take that up and, yeah. and, and maybe start the process over again at a certain point? I, I suspect that's true. Um, I know we have held projects for at least a year. Heather, can you help us with this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, th I think it would be a, a discussion. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that would have to happen um, in order to have that discussion. Um, so it's kind of hard to predict, but yeah. I, I don't know how to answer. <laughs> no, I don't think there's an answer. I just wouldn't want yeah. to freeze taxpayer money indefinitely. Obviously, <laughs> at a certain point, we pull it back and say, right. when you're ready, we're, you know, it's obviously this is something desirable and was supported by the group. So, right. I mean, I'm technically, technically, you guys request that funding is spent within 30 months of um, it being allocated at town meeting. Um, a lot of the times, 
projects request um, extensions on that 30 months. Um, but perhaps after multiple extensions, um, if it's still kind of hanging out there, then at some point, um, the committee at that point would vote to just close the project and the funding would be returned um, to the general fund, the CPC's general fund. And, and incidentally, I just wanted to announce tonight that Heather is not going to retire from our committee. She's retiring from all other committees, but she's with <laughs> us. <laughs> I just thought I'd say that. I mean, I, I, if, only wishes, if only wishes were true. Um, Bert, Bert. Well, just on that point on the funding and parking, you know, we've already got we're a million dollars into this project. If it, if, it, if the Grantham project unwinds, we're going to have an awful lot of money coming back to us. And I would just ask that we have coffee and donuts at meetings going forward. So that's a result <laughs> with all that money. Uh, but more to the point, more to the point of um, the criticism that hasn't West Concord gotten a lot of parks lately. And it's true. We've been really fortunate with the Drawer Land and, and the Bruce Freeman Trail and up, upgrades to Ride Out Park. Um, but I would also point out that we're, what we're talking about is a neighborhood with it, with a prison in it, and with um, contrary to the, the the desire of town to have affordable housing throughout town, it, it, there's an awful lot of affordable housing and and right there on Commonwealth Ave that we're putting in the, this new development there, and within the the business district of the Thoreau Depot, um, we are there is there was recently a mixed use project with 74 units of housing, eight of which were affordable, and there'll be a new building going in with I think it's 14 more units of mixed use housing and, and a couple or maybe it's 10 or 12 and a couple more units of affordable. The point being, there's a lot of people that are living in a cl close area that maybe don't have the same kind of access to open space and 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 the and the wonderful uh, uh, conservation lands that are on the other side of Route Two, and I think that. A lot's being asked of West Concord and has been, and I think that it's appropriate to invest in in in, in the in the in the, the the open space area that's in West Concord, especially right around the the junction and the Village Center, because some of these projects that are going in that the town has been supported. I think that's a counter argument to say isn't West Concord getting a getting getting a, a bit much. I, I think it's in balance. Thank you, Diane. We're here, here, and you know, um, uh, Linda Escobedo very graciously said to me, um, you know, Diane, when you talk about density of housing as perhaps being a challenge, I mean, she was spot on right. Uh, you know, den density, in fact, has its own synergy, doesn't it? It has its own vitality, and it, it produces a more vibrant community. And yet, at the same time, we need to support that density um, by mitigating the 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 giving space to that and giving room to that and breathing room to that. Um, and that's, that's really, an, that's an important principle. Yeah, Paul, thank you, Burton, that's beautifully put. I, I was gonna ask this question in the context of the MIUs a little later, but there was the funding issue and the, and the I'll call it the cash flow has been brought up. The, this issue of the expectation of, of the expenditures within 30 months of funding, is that in the, is that written, is that in the MOUs um, specifically? Yes, um, it's definitely in the grant agreements, and I believe it's listed in the MOUs as well. And, and so if they're not, then... then yep, it we, says we it, project we, completion. We, Once the project is complete, a final site visit, blah, blah, blah. Whenever possible, projects should be completed within 30 months following town meeting approval. Yeah, it, it took me a while to figure out that. <laughs> Projects that are 21 are actually funded in calendar year 22, but it's actually fiscal year 23. Yeah, you know, it, it is. It is a mind it, boggle, is it? it, look, it, <laughs> it took me it took months of education. Uh, um, years, and so you're way ahead of me. Go ahead. But you know, some of the projects don't start up for quite a while, and and the the funds linger. So I, I guess you know, there's no policy. There's an expectation, but really no policy that we have. Except, right. And so when we send out um, project status report requests um, annually, I do note when I send that email out and that request for the status report, if a project is beyond that 30 month mark. Um, and if it is, I request that the applicant includes a timeline for finishing the project and specifically requesting that extension. Great. Thank you. Thank so you. Clarify, sir. Okay. Um, the uh, Bruce Freeman Rail Trail 
Um, I, we did get pushback on that one as well. Well, what if we just didn't fund this? What would happen? Um, and, and it is a more kind of aesthetic improvement. Um, it, it is to some degree by putting benches up and everything else, a kind of safety improvement so that people have that they need to rest, a space to, to a place to sit down, a place to rest. Um, but I, I don't think this will produce, since it's not a huge budget item at $30,000, a whole lot of pushback. Now, the Aspet River Pedestrian Bridge. Um, one of the things that emerged in the discussion this time, more <laughs> clearly than it had in our discussions, interestingly, um, with, um, uh, not Marsha, but with, um, uh, you know, what, what, you know, the other person, it's not Marsha, it's- Elizabeth. Elizabeth, thank you very much. I can't believe I couldn't do that. Um, with Elizabeth, is that this is just the beginning of funding requests here. And I think we should anticipate, and it should be on the record that we should anticipate more funding requests as this goes forward. Um, and so if asked about this, one would have to honestly say uh, that yes, there will be additional funding requests. And the major question that has been asked to, in my experience has been, well, what about the businesses in the area? Are they contributing to this at all? Because it would help them um, in, 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 you know, immeasurably. And the answer that, that uh, Marsha has given, I think with such clarity and intelligence has been that, well, we don't ask them for this now. <laughs> you know, once we can see what's coming, we then turn to them and ask them for funding. Um, and so I think that we can count on that um, coming forward. We certainly can't count on them contributing, but we can count on that. Uh, can anybody hear anything else there that might? And we also want to get our our or in. Um, on this particular project, um, because it's ironically for Mass uh, DOT, it's not a lot of money, so it's going to be seen Diane, as a project. So, Tom, Diane, was there a, a discussion about the business community or maybe particular companies? There was providing some easement land access. Yes, they are providing some land easements. That's true, Tom. But that's that in in terms of how the, I think the, the 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 town taxpayers would see it as well. Yeah, but who was going to build on that bluff, <laughs> you know, hanging over the edge? That's probably not developable land by the by the, the people that own it. You know, what really matters is whether they're going to contribute funds to support this as an ongoing project. But you're right, Tom. Yeah, Peter. Yeah, I just want to um, touch on this point from a little bit of a, a broader perspective, or this project from a broader perspective. You know, there are I think three stakeholders here. Um, you know, when this project is talked about, it's often in the context of, of Baker Avenue, which is significant. I mean, if you drive your car through Baker Ave during the day, it's, I, I can't even imagine how many, how many folks work at Baker Avenue and this would give them the access to, um, to West Concord Center. But I don't think we want to lose sight of the fact that, um, Concord Green you know, is a potential beneficiary of this because of we've talked about this before, but the access on, on Main Street from Concord Green is, is pretty, pretty treacherous, especially if you're pushing a, a stroller or, or trying to ride a bike. Um, but also, you know, you don't want to overlook the merchants themselves and the opportunity. We've been through a tough couple of years with, with COVID and um, the if, if this could in fact, uh, you know, be something that would benefit the merchants as well, I think we need to, to keep that in mind. So that, I think that the bridge serves um, multiple stakeholders. And I guess that's, that's something I would suggest that we might, might wanna keep in mind as we move forward. Thank you, Peter. And that's so noted and that's really appreciated that um, I'm, I'm grateful. Um, Recreation department, um, I've heard nothing. Um, not, we received no pushback on that one at all. Um, so that's that's pretty good. And then staff and technical support, no pushback. Now, um, for those who've listened to these programs or been part of them, is, can anybody think of anything else I've missed that we need to consider for the town meeting? Okay, hearing, hearing none. Let us all rally at the town meeting. <laughs> well, you know, all this worry, and I have certainly worried, all this, you know, we'll probably just sail right through and there'll be no problem, but just in case. Um, 
Okay, we need to review and approve grant agreements and memorandum of understandings. And uh, Heather, could you pull up where we are on that right now? Do you want me to pull up each one or? I thought you usually had a sheet that showed us where we were on each MOU, no? I, I have I have every document drafted. It's okay. on the website. Um, so I don't I know I don't know if you want me to pull up each specific project. Why don't um, we, do, why don't we, we do don't it? we don't have to approve them at tonight's meeting because like I said earlier, um, funding is not available until July first. Um, so if we need more time to review these um, or make edits or anything to them, um, we can do that at our May meeting. Um, okay, well that would be that would be good. And if you could get, I know you see, I know that document's online, but if you could resend it to all of us uh, to look at, that would be. Um, they're they're all individual documents. Individual MOUs. Okay, I thought mm -hmm. I thought I remembered a chart with the MOUs, but I'm obviously remembering poorly. Um, this is this is not unimportant in terms of our tasks. Heather, when does the chairmanship get passed? When does that baton get passed? Is it after town meeting or is it July first? It's generally after town meeting. After town meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Peter. Um, just a, a question for Heather. In, in scanning through the, uh, the uh, various documents here, um, it looks like under the MOUs, a project status report request is, is discussed. But I believe in the grant agreements, I did not think I saw any mention of status reports. And I was wondering, was that, um, was there perhaps reason for that? Or is that something that we ought to include as well? Because it, it seems like regardless of project, there ought to be some type of a project status report. I know we've talked about frequency and typically that being done on an annual basis. Right. Um, I, yeah, I don't think that's actually any, that's, generally not something that's listed in the grant agreement. Um, that's something we can definitely add. I can add a line about that. That would be advantageous, I think. Good catch, Peter, thank you. I just thought for the sake of, of consistency, you know, a project is a project and um, it'll be helpful. I would think it would be helpful on an annual basis if we could at least get, get that update. Well, we do it anyway, but it's nice to have it in print. I mean, in writing, I think that's fantastic. Uh, Paul. Yeah, just a minor point on the MOU for the recreation facilities plan. Should I think that should be addressed to Anna McEwen rather than Marsha Rasmussen, right? She's the department. They're all addressed to Marsha and Carrie. Oh, is that yes? Is that, yeah, so that yeah, should, be, it should be Anna. Thank you. Maybe Anna and Carrie, I, I guess. That's Thank my comment. You. Thank you. Uh, let's look at the approval of the minutes. Um, uh, the February 15th minutes, do I hear anyone who would who offers any emendations to those or changes? If not, may I see a motion to accept them? Or hear a motion to accept them? And I make a motion that we accept the minutes from February 15th as drafted. Thank you, Bert, and they were terrific minutes, actually. Um, do I hear a second? A second. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Paul? Yay yes. Yes. Uh, Tom? Yes. John? Yes. Sarah? Aye. Uh, Peter? Yes. Charles? Aye, uh, yes. Uh, Burton? Yes. And I, it's unanimous. Thank you very much. And then the minutes of March 15th. Um, I was away for that one, so I need to abstain. Okay, thank you. I, I have looked at them pretty carefully. I don't see any changes to recommend as anybody else. Diane, did we, ha we have just four people present? Yes, I just we did. didn't remember that. No. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Because, I thank mean, you. Remember, no. remember we started with a larger group and then we quickly rapidly shrunk. Um, oh, okay, thank you. I came right. on board uh, for a while. I mean, I mean, graciously, I mean, for heaven's sake, from Europe came yeah. on board <laughs> for a while. Uh, it's just a, a kind of <laughs> just an amazing gesture on his part, but it was a small group that time. Right. So, thank um, you. Do I hear a, um, a motion to accept those minutes? I, so I move to accept the minutes of uh, March 15th. Thank you very much, Paul. Do I hear a second? 
Well, come on, don't be shy. Just a second. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <laughs> okay, Paul. Yes. Tom. Yes. John. Yes. Uh, Sarah, you're gonna you're gonna demure, right, Peter? Were you there, Peter? I was not. I was not the meeting. So I don't know if I'm permitted to vote. Oh. Not, not Te really. Te <clears throat> technically, you can vote on minutes if you weren't there, if you watched the um, the video. <laughs> I guess I'm voting for half the minutes then. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. One half. <laughs> Peter, are you going to confess to having watched the video or not? <laughs> I read the minute, but I did not watch the video. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, Peter, we're so dead. <laughs> Charles? Um, I, was, I wasn't there. I was also not there. A burden? I'm in the same boat as Charles and Peter. That's what, that's what I thought. There was a small, a, a small little contingent here. Well, <laughs> for those of us who were there, um, I, and and for those who were there, it was, we it was unanimous among those attending, and so declare. Um, Heather, those are your last minutes, except the ones for this meeting. Um, we yeah. I, I, well, I might have to draft the May ones. I'm not sure. <laughs> ah, well. Oh, that. Was Bad. Yeah, have, you'll, you'll have a week. Oh, that? <laughs> uh, I, I have a, a question. This is my first first time through the rodeo here. So after town meeting, what do we do until the next set of applications? What's our what's our business? Well, our what? business is first to, to to nail down the memorandums of understanding and get those yeah. get those details. And also, we can't do. I mean, some of these things await the town meeting vote. Presuming that sails through, then we have the memorandums of understanding to be, you know, clearly constructed. And John, oh, that was my question. The May seventeenth meeting um, is really devoted to the um, MOUs with the with the town projects and the um, specified conditions for the non-town projects. That's exactly right. Okay. Uh, we also, you will also need to. Um, update your plan for the, the coming year, um, get the application ready to go. Um, you generally host um, two public informational sessions prior to the application deadline in, in September. Um, so you guys keep busy. Yeah, we do. And, and, and it's Will you have all that for us at the next meeting as proposed dates? Um, I will try. Okay. Mr. Seidenor's most recent memo suggests we may not have as much money next year as we did this year. If anybody has mm. read that, I think the, the 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 funding available to us may not be as generous um, in the coming year as it was this year. So that's just um, a heads up, you know, to all who are um, kind of paying attention to this. Uh, Linda, do you have any comment to add? I do actually. Um, you know, I, I want to say that this year. Uh, like past years, has not been without its challenges for this committee. And I can't think of a better group of people to have been brought together to deliberate uh, and um, bring your good sense, not only your expertise, but bring your good sense of humor um, to dealing with all of this. So, uh, you know, I, I think as well prepared as you are and as, you know, the, the, the very conscientious and well informed vetting that you've done on these projects, um, I, I think. Um, there will be success at, at the town meeting. And so thank you all for everything you've done. And um, I, the other piece of advice I, I would just uh, give, and, and you're all aware of this, of course, um, you know, when, when you do find yourself asked um, questions, to try to be as succinct as possible and hit the high road as opposed to getting lost in the details, because I think that... Um, just helps facilitate the process. Um, you know, accurate information, of course, but. Um... I mean, I have to use sentences and not paragraphs. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> it's, so it's so easy to get pulled down into that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and since this, I think it's going to be my last meeting, thank you all for the support you've provided this year. You've been just brilliant. And I'm, I'm eternally grateful. So, okay. and I and I and I and I want to say that uh, you know the both you and Heather, your ability to navigate and um, navigate through all of the the, the uh, interesting issues and aspects that have come up this year uh, is been well appreciated. 
Thank you, Linda, very much. And, and Heather, the, 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 we have boundless respect and affection for you. All right, thank you all. Have a good evening. <laughs>